Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr Caroline Pudney and I'm from the University of Chester and I'm an archaeologist that specialises in late Iron Age and Roman archaeology in Britain. Um, but today I want to talk to you about um, the kind of the conquest but mostly the sort of the frontier that was um, in Roman Britain, specifically the western frontier of Britannia. And to do that I want to explore the fortresses and the networks of the frontier but also consider the other elements that made up that frontier, the rural settlement and the people, perhaps most importantly. Thinking about the interaction and fusion of culture before sort of thinking also about the key questions and problems that we have in understanding frontier dynamics, specifically in relation to imperial power. So I've divided this lecture into six parts. The first couple of introductory bits, um, a brief overview of the conquest of Roman Britain, um, but also uh, the frontiers of the Roman world more generally. With a view then to go in and focus in more detail on the western frontier of Britannia itself, the different elements of command and power of that frontier, the reasons for that um, control, that continued perhaps military control, but also then finishing up with perhaps a more holistic approach to the sort of coexistence and the patchwork of people and things that happened during Roman rule in Western Britain. So the Roman conquest of Britain, where our story begins. Roman historians tell us that in 43 CE, the army at the dictat of Emperor Claudius invaded Britain in order to support an ousted ally or client king or ruler. Imperial power thus became directly entangled in the Iron Age politics of Britain. Now, Caesar had done this with varying effects some 100 years earlier. However, this time, Roman power, power would be far more lasting across much of Britain. In reality, Claudius also needed a military victory to help improve his image as emperor. Additionally, natural resources that Britain provided could certainly not be underestimated. Natural occurrences of lead with high quantities of silver, tin, copper, iron, wheat, slaves and gold were surely on Claudius's mind. When it comes to the events of the invasion and subsequent conquest, we're able to draw upon some details from classical sources, such as from Tacitus's biography of Agricola, where he describes the achievements of his father-in-law. But otherwise, we largely have to rely on archaeological evidence, which of course comes with its own problems. So we're told in 43 CE, uh, the army consisting of four legions, around 20,000 men, and some auxiliary units, perhaps equal numbers of men, landed somewhere in southeast England, possibly sort of Richborough in Kent or around that area. The initial invasion phase only really got as far as Colchester, or Camelodunum, as it was then called. Nonetheless, Claudius's victory was commemorated and communicated in various ways, including in his coinage. And here we actually have um, a gold aureus of Claudius, which does in fact commemorate his defeat of Britain. So you can see you've got the head of Claudius on the obverse. He's there depicted laureate, so he's got the laurel wreath around his head. On the reverse, you've got a triumphal arch inscribed, surmounted by equestrian statue between two trophies. The statue has its right arm extended and holds a spear in the left hand. And on the arch, you can see it says De Britan. This one was actually excavated in Coimbatore, which is South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. And that kind of tells us how far the news of his victory managed to travel well beyond the confines of the empire itself. But nonetheless, this was a real statement of Claudius's victory over the Britons. But that was only the beginning. The conquest took place in phases over some 40 plus years, as you can see on the left hand image here. The campaigns under various commanders gradually moved north and westwards, conquering territories with varying levels of resistance as they went. And as they went, military bases and roads were constructed. The evidence from their foundation, use and abandonment from, form much of our understanding of the chronology of the conquest. Once the landscape had been claimed by Rome, the next phase of province building was required, the installation of civil administration, 
As a result, we begin to see towns and administrative centres becoming more common, starting in the southeast and again moving out north and westwards into the second century. Many military bases were actually converted into centres of administration and or commerce as well. Roads became consolidated and a network of infrastructure emerged. Many existing settlements were incorporated into this new socio-economic system. Some were abandoned, new settlements were founded, but the province emerged as a patchwork of different types of settlement, people, culture and tradition. However, within this process, the North and West were never fully transferred to civilian control. And you can kind of see that in the distribution we've got here of known rural settlements in Roman Britain. So rural settlements being uh, probably where the majority of the population lived um, in Roman Britain um, and making up very much the majority of settlement that we've got for the south and the east of England especially. And they would have been interspersed with towns and administrative centres. However, as you get to the west of Britain and the north of Britain, this lack of civilian settlement may indicate um, the fact that your the frontier zone functioned slightly differently or was made up of slightly different populations and ways of life. Although with archaeological evidence, we do have to be quite careful because these are also areas of Britain that haven't seen quite so much uh, modern building. And without modern building, you don't have commercial archaeologists going in um, to excavate the archaeology prior to construction and development. So we also need to bear in mind with archaeology that an absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. Nonetheless, the evidence does show us that the North and the West were never fully transferred to con civilian control. And instead, these area areas formed frontiers, retaining quite a substantial military presence and oversight. site of these frontiers you had the three permanent legionary bases York in the northeast or Ibaracum, Chester or Diva Victrix in the northwest of England and Iscusalurum modern-day Killian in the southeast of Wales and these were the main kind of links I suppose that linked the, the northern frontier uh, and what was then sort of constituted by Hadrian's Wall further north and the western frontier itself that we're going to be looking at today. So by 120 CE, most of what is now England and Wales had become part of the Roman Empire. At its edge, Britain formed part of the imperial frontiers, which stretched miles around the German Limes, all the way across to uh, modern day Syria, Lebanon and Israel, down through Egypt and across uh, into Morocco. Some of it is designated as a World Heritage Site and it has that internationally sort of recognised protection. Part of that includes the Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall in Britain. But as an island, as part of this network of frontiers or this frontier system, Britain is quite unique. Yes, you have walls that are evidence of a border between the Empire and Barbaricum, but the coastline of the island also acts as a border, especially between Britannia and Hibernia or Ireland, for example. So when studying imperial frontiers and power, we must not only focus on those that form part of the UNESCO inscription, the World Heritage Inscription, but we also need to think about the other elements of the frontier and how that connectivity kind of works together to create a, a kind of a frontier system. We need to think about the military aspects of that frontier, but also recognise that they're not solely military in function, nor did they only act as a border to keep people out. Studies by archaeologists have in fact highlighted the ways in which they functioned as, yes, military networks, but how they served as important communication routes. They connected roads and waterways, allowing access into, through and out of the empire. They also incorporated civilian settlements. Frontier zones were spaces of exchange and interaction 
of the interchange of peoples from across the empire, as well as barbarican. They were therefore cultural melting pots. Drawing on New World archaeology, anthropological studies of borders and borderlands and diasporas and mobility and migration, it's now apparent that Roman frontiers can be approached as contact zones or transnational fields, shifting zones of innovation, recombination and transformation, not necessarily solely military. And for me, the relationship between a frontier and its core zone, the dense population or wealth and political power is fascinating, as is their migrant or transient populations and the way in which borderlands they often involved contested cultural, religious, linguistic, economic and political boundaries. So when it comes to the western frontier of Britannia, what we're looking at there is not something that's delineated by a wall. We've got no nice sort of stone structure demarcating its core zone. Instead, we have a diffuse military network. We have a coastline which perhaps creates a line. We have a mixture of upland and lowland areas. But fundamentally, it, it existed as a political tool, as a means of connecting the province with the rest of the empire. It was responsive to broader imperial situations and therefore it changed over time. The frontier was not static, it was dynamic. It was also affective in that its existence had emotional and sensorial impacts upon those who interacted with it. The military installations of the Western Frontier can be seen um, on this map here. As you can see, this idea of a diffuse frontier, very much concentrated around the peninsula of modern day Wales, but not restricted to it. And actually the extent to which the Western frontier stretched out beyond modern day Wales is still very much under discussion by archeologists. The likelihood is it had a network that connected it up to the Northern frontiers of Hadrian's um, wall, but also possibly down the North coast of sort of Somerset, Devon and into Cornwall. In that beyond that was sort of the Irish Sea and Barbaricum. The chronology of post-conquest events shows manipulation of a landscape according to shifting power relations. And some of the earliest military kind of imperial markers, if you like, on the landscape would have been temporary marching camps or campaign bases that would have formed um, overnight or perhaps seasonal bases for the army as they kind of conquered territory and moved northwards and westwards. As here, you can see the remnants of these as earthworks in the bottom right hand corner um, of the marching camp at the Pagoon and um, the Brecon Brecon Beacons, but perhaps as perhaps more ghost shadows in aerial crop marks showing up in dry summers, such as the one between Corowence and Chepstow in South East Wales on the top left hand side there. But what you tend to find are emerging in the early 50s CE we begin to see the campaign activity move from the southeast, as I mentioned earlier, further west and north. And that's the same in this area. So from Usk in southeast Wales, um, northwards and westwards, telling us in what direction and in what sort of chronology the campaigns are moving across the landscape. A lot of forts appear to have been founded in the early AD 70s as part of the first advance into the northwest. Um, so North Wales and up into um, uh, the northwest of England, you start to see more and more military installations appearing in the archaeological record um, dating from the sort of 70s CE. It's somewhat uncertain the ways or the sequence of conquest in some areas, but generally um, the, the evidence suggests a line of advance from bases in the northwest Midlands, such as Roxeter, Chesterton and Whitchurch, following the line of King Street North through Middlewich, Wilderspool and Walton Dale. From there, the route took in Lancaster and via the Loon and Eden Valleys up to Carlisle. So you can start to see as we move through um, the 50s and 60s and 70s and into the Flavian period, the density of military installations across the landscape increases. The campaigns 
at this point are really kind of hotting up. And much of the ones across the Western frontier are associated with the campaigns of Agricola from AD 77 to 83. Beyond this map in the Northwest, the consolidation of military occupation under Agricola's Guerrilla, Guerrilla, governorship saw the construction of the route Northeast from the legionary fortress at Chester. And along that line was constructed a fort at the important strategic position of Northwich in the late 70s. So it's here you're starting to see as also the campaigning forts and fortresses turning into a garrison of bases and ancillary structures. Alongside that, we have evidence for the felling of timber, not just for the construction of timber, timber military installations. What we can also see it in large scale deforestation across the area. So in the pollen evidence, the environmental evidence. So these kind of networks of military bases, as Burnham and Davis suggest, were designed to overawe the vanquished, to remind the vanquished, to let them know that they are now under Roman control. They were strategically located, concentrated around um, supplies, but also key points in the landscape, river routes, roads, to ensure that they could police the people and the landscape. As we move into the Hadrianic period, the, the arrangement of these networked bases changes. We've got a decrease in forts that's paralleled with a slight increase, or the appearance, I should say, of towns. Carmarthen, for example, in West Wales, is no longer a military site. It gets converted into a civilian centre, administrative centre. The regional capital at Kyrwent is established. The once legionary fortress at Roxeter in Shropshire is now a town. So you start to see a kind of a shift in, in the balance of power, perhaps from solely military power to perhaps more of a blend of military and civilian power. And the same goes in the northwest of England, um, where it appears to have entered a period of some stability with far more dispersed garrisons and an absence of demonstrable activity at a number of forts. So the frontier is shifting, its physicality is changing, and that continues well into the late Roman period, where we see a division of Britain into two provinces, probably between around 197 and 216 CE. Presumably as a measure to prevent concentrating too large a force in the hands of a single governor. So again, it's about negotiating imperial power in particular situations. No longer conquest, it's no longer just garrisoning. It's now about playing imperial politics and making sure that no one becomes too powerful. The divide is generally thought to have followed, followed Kivitas boundaries or sort of county boundaries, I suppose, would be the modern equivalent along the Mersey especially. By around 312, a further subdivision is made to create four provinces. This leaves two of the main legionary fortresses at Chester and Killian, or Diva and Isca, in Britannia Prima, along with modern day Cheshire and Wales, the West Midlands and southwestern England. While north of the Mersey, what was Brigantian territory, formed the majority of Britannia Secunda, with legionary command from York. So the fourth century frontier is looking remarkably different to that, that of the later first and second centuries. Additionally, the defences changes as well. We start to see more coastal defences in the northwest. Those that were already there become strengthened. Lancaster, for example, is a prime um, uh, candidate to sort of study this, this phenomenon. Anglesey also becomes part of a similar coastal system that looks around um, the kind of the northwest coast of Britain. So we now in the later period actually get two distinct but interactive frontiers rather than perhaps one western frontier. And that renegotiation of politics, command and control is in direct response to broader imperial political situations, as well as the situation at home. But we're here to think about the Western frontier. 
So how did this frontier function? One of the central questions, um, and one which remains to be fully answered, if I'm honest, but the fundamental political agents or institutions of the frontier were the legions and their fortresses. So the basic layout of any Roman fort or fortress can be seen here. And ultimately, there were more or less variations on a theme. You have a classic playing card shape, a rectangle with sort of curved corners, four main entrances linking up with a street grid. The most important buildings were at the centre, the headquarters building, the Quincipia um, and the treasury, housing um, the standards, the eagle, that sort of thing. So around the outside, you have barrack blocks and other buildings protecting those important central spaces. Forts and fortresses were constructed so that they could be self-sufficient in times of siege and were usually heavily defended, as you can see in the bottom right picture here, by a series of banks and ditches and walls or palisades or timber fences, um, perhaps in their early phases of construction. But it would also have had somewhat overbearing gateways, especially um, with the main entrances, the Port of Praetoria and the Port of Decumenica. The major political powerhouses at either edge of the western frontier were Diva Victrix, modern day Chester, and Iscus Alurum, modern day Calian both situated at each end of the natural peninsula that forms modern Wales. Diva Victrix was initially constructed in the AD 70s by the Legio II Adiatrix, and that initial construction was timber. So banks and ditches with timber walling and largely timber buildings inside. As the Roman, Roman army advanced north against the Brigantes and the Decciangli, the defences of Chester Fortress um, were made out of turf and clay banks, towers, gates, probably a single ditch at that, that, uh, that point. There are hints that Chester played a role in pre-Flavian military activity in the northwest, as continued study is gradually bringing forward the foundation date of the legionary fortress into the middle or even early 70s. It was later the garrison was replaced by the 20th legion in the 80s. It was situated strategically um, on the Dee, so the River Dee, uh, going to the kind of the inland of the frontier region, but also easy access out to the Dee estuary and the Irish Sea. You also had good connectivity to some of the main roads like Watling Street that went straight down to London. Here's a reconstruction um, of the fortress as it would have li looked like in probably the second or third centuries AD. As with most long lived military bases, a civilian extramural settlement or canabai emerged immediately around the outside of the walls, usually lining the roads into and out of the fortress. So it was able to make the most of trade and business with the fortress, but also further afield. You've got the amphitheatre there situated quite prominently to the southeast of the fortress as well. There was even a settlement over the bridge to the south, the River Dee, at Handbridge. In comparison, Isca Silura, similarly situated um, on sort of uh, riverine transport routes at the confluence of the River Usk and the Afon Fluid, with easy access out to the River Severn, but also uh, up into the kind of uh, the uplands of central Wales. It was founded under Julius Frontinus's campaigns um, in around AD 75 by the Legio II Augusta. And they remained the permanent garrison of um, Isca Silurum. As you can see on the picture at the top there, um, Isca Silurum has not really been settled upon since. It's not really been built upon. There's a real lack of modern settlement. And this makes it a really unique kind of opportunity to understand um, fortress life in, in the Western frontier, but in Britain more generally, unlike Chester, which has the medieval and the modern cities on top of it. Again, there's an amphitheatre situated outside the walls. So here are the walls highlighted with the amphitheatre just to the left of that, um, that image. And again, 
a vicus roadside settlement over the river at Great Bulmore, and also um, additional kind of cannabi or extramural civilian settlements. Here's a reconstruction of some of that and um, that you can see there with the um, over the river settlement as well as settlement lining some of the roads in and out of the fortress in each direction. Perhaps one of the most noticeable things for those already living around these areas was the change to the landscape that would have resulted from the construction of these colossal structures. I mentioned before the construction out of timber would have relied heavily upon local forest and timber resources. They would have demonstrated new styles of building, new different architectures, and therefore very much signalled the Roman presence. But once they become constructed in stone, so for example, Diva at the end of the first century and Isca in the sort of late first, early second centuries, this kind of permanency of Roman presence was really articulated. Not only that, the monumental size of some of these buildings with the bright orange terracotta roofs really would have demonstrated the might of Rome. So to think about these new building materials and how that articulated Roman power, the affordances that they had, the impact those materials had upon the people that encountered them. I've always loved the idea that for many soldiers, that kind of building style would have been a sense of comfort, especially if you're posted in a frontier zone away from home. Lots of the soldiers were recruited from across the empire and posted in Britain. These would have been familiar sites. But for the local population, good grief, having something like this on your doorstep certainly would not have gone unnoticed. But let's have a look at these bases in more detail. The Diva Victrix, the classic playing card shape with all the usual buildings, nothing too unexpected there. But it's 20% larger than other Roman fortresses in Britain. And there are some odd features in the middle of it, namely the elliptical building, which is the sort of the one on the left, and this giant courtyard style building that you can see in the plan there, um, kind of going from the top to bottom on the plan. So the elliptical building, so-called because of its elliptical kind of almost oval shape, was built of finely dressed masonry. It was set in foundations of high grade concrete and occupied most of the insular or the, the street block lying to what we call the dextral rear or the northwest of the headquarters building, the Principia, you can see in the centre. Work on it was abandoned well before its completion, however. So although it measures 60 by 30 metres and has a, a central courtyard or oval courtyard, 12 wedge-shaped rooms around the outside, fronted by a colonnaded portico, it was clearly part of the original kind of plan of the fortress, but for some reason it was never fully constructed in one go. It's been dated by a lead pipe which was found, which bore um, a cast inscription recording the date of its manufacture during the reign of Vespasian, when Gnaeus Julius Agricola was governor of Britain, so in the first half of, sort of 79 CE therefore telling us that this was part of the original fortress plan in its earliest kind of conception. There have been a number of suggestions that I've come across um, that relate to its function, uh, including a palace, a weapons training school or a scholar, a market. However, none of those suggestions are really convincing. David Mason, who has um, literally written the book on Raymond Chester, suggests that this may well have been um, a religious function with the 12 wedge-shaped rooms perhaps housing the 12 kind of main deities of, of the Roman kind of state religion at this time. Whatever its actual function, one thing's clear, it's unique and it's clearly something very special. Other elements at Chester include elaborate cornicing in the walling, which is very kind of unlike the usual functional military stonework that you tend to get in other forts and fortresses. So other hints that perhaps Chester is something a little bit different or a little bit special and its size, of course, as well. Here we have a plan of the elliptical building 
Um, you can see it reconstructed there um, and those 12 kind of wedge shaped rooms and the fountain at the centre of that courtyard. The second special building, this monumental kind of courtyard type building, is another kind of odd one. Again, it's part of the original plan for the fortress, but its construction halted for some 30 years or so. The right hand side, we've got the plan of the original and the unfinished kind of Flavian building. It was modified um, in around 100 um, as well. And again, building was sort of stop, start, stop, start on it. This was slightly more utilitarian in its construction with identical ranges on all sides, very much like a sort of a basilica style or administrative or storage style building that you might find elsewhere in the empire. But again, there is whatever it is, there's evidence that potentially help us explain why these buildings formed part of the fortress at Chester. And one of those bits of evidence is an inscription that was originally fixed to the back wall of a portico that runs along the frontage of this building. The lettering style of the inscription suggests early 2nd century AD. And here we have um, a drawing of it. The use of narrative prose rather than formulaic shorthand should be noted. It suggests it's a specialised type of inscription described as broadly administrative. So to record public records of decrees and rulings taken at the highest level of government. It usually therefore relates to political and constitutional status of communities, such as a colonia or a municipia. And here we have something that suggests perhaps a change in authority or governance of this fortress or perhaps this part of the fortress. And this is led together with the elliptical building um, and the kind of the very fancy masonry, the fact that it's a 20 percent larger than any other fortress. It's led David Mason to suggest that um, this part of the fortress may have formed a bit of a sort of a governor's enclave, so the seat of a governor for a period of time. And the reason that it might have been the seat of a governor was perhaps to launch an invasion of Ireland, which never happened, presumably because uh, troops were needed up in the north to construct Hadrian's Wall. So these special buildings have very much been interpreted as relating to the rule of a governor or the seat of the governor, suggesting that it was to be an important seat of imperial power. That is the imperial power that was invested in the provincial governor himself, because in provincial terms, the governor was effectively encapsulated imperial power. But something happened to change that plan. We have a fundamental change in the, in the administrative or territorial arrangements of the fortress. Something in the wider situation of Britannia changed that meant that never really happened. So I just want to kind of reiterate, I suppose, the fact that here we have a military site, a military installation, but that encompasses monumental building that you might find more associated with metropolitan and administrative centres rather than military ones. So what's happening to the southern end of the frontier? So Isca, Silurum, similarly playing card shape, nothing particularly eyebrow raising about the internal layout at all. The Principia building in the centre, barrack blocks around the outside, monumental entrance ways, um, even an extramural bathhouse and amphitheatre, very much like at Chester. However, it does have its fair share of odd architecture. But unlike at Chester, where it's inside the fortress, here it appears to be in the extramural areas, specifically um, this bit highlighted yellow. The dating of this sort of complex of buildings is quite difficult. Um, we excavated this in 2011 as part of a team at uh, Cardiff University excavating this. And it looks as though it possibly predates the amphitheatre. And that the amphitheatre was kind of squished in between this set of buildings and the fortress. So Sir Mortimer Wheeler suggests that the amphitheatre was constructed around AD 90, um, which means that our building must be quite early in the life of the fortress, if the fortress was only ex um, founded in the early AD 70s. It also excavations, initial excavations suggest that many of the rooms 
part of this kind of building complex were disused as early as the mid second century. So it, whatever it was, it was relatively short lived or changed its functional purpose, much like those buildings in Chester. The architecture of it, again, high status. Uh, rubbish dumps you can see in the section edge um, after these, this particular room has gone out of use. So here you've got um, a room that would have formed a long corridor of rooms. Um, opus signinum flooring, so this crushed tile and lime mortar to create a, quite a, a pretty kind of concrete flooring. You've got um, substantially built uh, masonry walls, some of which seem to have been quite complex and possibly formed the basis for um, vaulted ceilings or archways. We found some barrel vaulting in there. But also elements of painted plaster. So very nice. Um, room decoration as well, still surviving. But also the use of brick and tile to create walls. This is a very Mediterranean building style and not something you tend to see in military architecture in Britain. The fortress itself, lots of stone building out here in this particular set of buildings, more tile use for what we call these sort of stylobate walls. So these are walls that have terracotta or brick foundations, but then would have had um, columns on top. And the, lot, the whole lot could have been plastered quickly and painted to make it look like marble. So these buildings could be thrown up very quickly and cheaply and made to look quite fancy. These buildings also fronted the river access to this part of the fortress area. As at Chester, interpretations for the set of buildings at Killian vary very much drawing upon comparative structures found on the continent in both military and non-military sites, such as at Nijmegen, Vindernissa and Frejus. They go from trade hub to gladiator school. However, some epigraphic evidence found nearby may help explain its function, and especially when we look at what was going on at Chester. We have a dedication to the Temple of Diana found nearby, which may indicate that perhaps, like the elliptical building at Chester, there may have also been a religious element to these buildings at Killian too. So we have military bases overseeing a frontier, but even with, within something that on the surface should be military, we find religious elements, aspects potentially of civilian administration, Mediterranean building styles, rather than perhaps your kind of formulaic, very functional military stuff, possibly all due to a presence even if fleeting or never fully realised, of a provincial governor. And based on the dating, we might have Frontinus in Killian or perhaps Agricola in Chester. So the military powerhouses are not quite that simple when it comes to understanding military and civilian distinctions in frontier contexts, especially when it comes to the kind of the distribution of power. But what about the rest of the frontier? It wasn't solely made up of military bases and installations. So how was it administered and what types of settlements were people living in? Outside the military elements, administration of the frontier, um, parts of the frontier zone and responsibilities appear to have been handed over to civilian oversight. This is largely in line with a general policy across the empire to hand over to local councils usually made up of a mixture of local population, together with perhaps retired soldiers if needed. So we see in a Western frontier sort of zone, the emergence of urbanism in parts of, of the landscape, which provided the main mechanism for Roman state to administer its provinces through the institutions of regional government for tax collection, local legal matters, and so on. So the establishment of Kivitas capitals or kind of county towns, I suppose, is how you might refer to them as, as nowadays, to administer the Kivitates or the, the regions or the, the counties, I guess, would be our modern equivalent, um, emerge even around the edge of the Western frontier. 
So for example, like Roxeter starts off as a fortress and then gets converted into a Kivitas capital of Viraconium. Gloucester, Gleavum, begins as a fortress, becomes an administrative centre. Carmarthen in West Wales starts off as military, gets converted into a civilian administrative centre. Crowent, however, in South East Wales, is a new town specifically founded for civilian administration and just down the road from Isca Silurum. So if we look at Venta Silurum or Crowent, the Kivitas capital of the Silures, we're told of the, the, the Silures region of, of what is now modern day southeast Wales, you can see it's got um, quite a sort of st straight kind of typical Romano-British urban layout. Um, it's a sort of a, a grid system that has uh, administrative and religious buildings usually at the centre and then a mix of shops and houses um, in various different insulae or, or street blocks um, throughout the town. Uh, main access routes to the east and the west. And again, a bit like Kyleon, it's not really ever been built on since. So the way we know, the reason we know this is a Kivitas capital is because of an inscription known as the Paulinus Stone that recounts a decree of the Ordinates for public works on the tribal council of the Silures. And this is, tells us that the Silures, or this, the people of this region, were granted under close Roman supervision, a form of self-government. Like in most Kivitas capitals, this probably took place in the earlier part of the second century. Which kind of ties in with our foundation dates for the town around AD 120. It's here where the council would meet, law courts would be set up and other administrative duties could be carried out. People could go to pay their taxes. And as I said before, unlike Roxeter and some of the other towns that started life as a fortress, this was a new town. It was laid out uh, in, um, in the image of what a provincial Roman town should look like. The buildings emerged in the landscape that were purpose built to fit the Roman administrative processes. At the centre of the town, you have the Forum Basilica. The marketplace and civic hall, a very sort of classical phenomenon. Nothing really like this existed in pre-conquest Britain. You have shops. No doubt Kyrent was a busy market town, being a favourite centre for troops on leave from not far away in Killian. The facilities provided included public baths, temples and a variety of shops. The basis of the economy was its agriculture, there were several farms even within the town, sort of market gardens. We've also got evidence for petty manufacturing and the retail trade as well. So these kind of um, trappings of Roman urbanism are perhaps less threatening materialisations of Roman power, but still nonetheless indicators that Britain was being administered by Rome. But when it comes to towns and especially administrative centres, such as Kivitas capitals, very few exist in and around the Western Frontier region. And where they do exist, they're relatively small compared to the big towns of the southeast, like modern day Colchester and St Albans or Camelodunium and Verulamium, as they were then known as. What does this tell us about the nature of the frontier zones? Where are the civilian population living? If the populations of towns aren't particularly big, what does that tell us about life in and around the frontier itself? One of the key things that I think impacts the nature of the Western frontier is that it sits on a rich bed of mineral resources. As such, it is likely that large amounts of land were under imperial control, either directly or indirectly and usually with some sort of military oversight. So perhaps related to this, the large proportion of the civilian population appear to have lived in the civilian settlements that grew up around the numerous military sites. Civilian settlements associated with military installations of largely northern and western distributions in Britain, i.e. they tally with the frontier zones, yes, but also zones of intensive mineral extraction. <laughs> 
evidence suggests that there was a real need for state for the state to maintain levels of control and therefore financial benefit. Quite how important mineral extra extraction was for the Roman state has very recently been highlighted in the discovery of this lead pig or ingot from near Wrexham in northeast Wales. Currently, it's on display at the British Museum as part of the Nero exhibition. The pig appears to be unique due to the inscription made up of ligatured letters referring to one of the governors of Roman Britain, Marcus Trebellius Maximus. Trebellius Maximus was appointed by Nero in 63 to 69 and is only known from literary sources. And therefore, the ingot may well represent the only known inscription that can be attributed to him. So it's really important in that sense and demonstrates how archaeology can really kind of add or complement as well as sometimes question our understanding of the classical sources. But it's also really important for our understanding of the Western frontier, especially. Chemical analysis of the ingot done by Liverpool University tells us that it has come from the North Wales lead seams, specifically the flincher ones. And that tells us that these lead sources were being exploited as early as the reign of Nero. Now, if we refer back to the chronology of the frontier here, this means that the industrial extraction and processing of lead ores in this area was occurring during the conquest phases and possibly before either legionary fortresses at Caerleon or Chester were constructed. So rather than waiting until the territory was consolidated under Roman rule, the need for lead and silver, because this stuff has a very high silver content, and therefore money were of key importance to imperial strategies. And this importance continues through the lifespan of the frontier and ultimately of Roman rule in Britain. The army, as a mechanism for the imperial state, retained control of mineral extraction, processing and exportation, as is evidenced in around sites like Flint along the coast into Wales from Chester, just north of the Flintshire lead seams. Some of the ingots from this site, stamped with Decky Angli from the local population, have been found in Chester, but also as far as Rome itself. Tile stamps from many of the buildings in the area show legionary markers, the Legio XX or Legio 20 markers. So here we have an industrial settlement consisting of lead and silver processing, overseen by a procurator metallorum, so an official to oversee and maintain state income from metal processing, and likely though carried out by a combination of military and civilian personnel are not forgetting, of course, slaves. So perhaps under the direct or um, control of Chester, um, we've got evidence for docks, storehouses, um, kiln sites, water mills, full on industrial processing, cemeteries and housing or accommodation. So many civilians were able to make a living from the continued presence of the Roman army whether that was through supplying the soldiers and the garrisons with goods, perhaps um, agricultural goods, or whether it was perhaps working directly for them in industrial um, activities. So the presence of the army, their role maintaining the frontier, their capacity as tax collectors, customs officers and mine operators meant that other people could also make a living and a life in and around the frontier. So it's not really surprising then that a large proportion of the population lived in and around the military installations themselves in the extramural settlements, like at the auxiliary forts of Sigontium in modern day Carnarvon in North West Wales, or Brackengaia in Powys, or Caesus in Mid Wales also, where occupation quite often stretches well into the fourth century, suggesting that the vibrancy of civilian occupation in and around the frontier may well have been dependent upon the presence of the army and the two become dialectically linked and dependent upon each other. So Roman state institutions, the people in their employ and those who were external or at arm's length to the state were able to coexist within the frontier zone in a mutually beneficial context. But bound up in that interaction 
different cultural traditions and beliefs were shared and transformed. And the area was a cultural melting pot. Nowhere is this perhaps more evident than in the religious practices and burial rites of those around the frontier. Imperial and state divine power was materialized in the construction and dedication of temples to the Roman pantheon. But equally, as is seen across the provinces, religious and cultural syncretism epitomizes the coexistence of ways of life. As is seen in this altar, Recovered from Chester, it's dedicated to Jupiter Tannerus, where we can see Jupiter has been fused with the Celtic thunder god Tannerus and dedicated by Lucius Eleutherius Prizan to the Galerian voting tribe of Clunia, so a member of the 20th Legion based at Chester. Religious and cult life across the empire was vibrant and dynamic. And that is certainly no different in and around the frontier zone. The freedom to worship um, particular religions, to follow certain cults, was equally as possible in the frontier as it was in the rest of Roman Britain. Other inscriptions that can also help us think about the mobility of people and therefore ideas and practices are tombstones. Commemorating the deceased, they often follow a formulaic structure de detailing the deceased's origins or perceived or ancestral origins at least, their career, especially if a soldier. And sometimes they depict the deceased or contain images associated with their commemorative identity. So for example, here, we've got a tombstone of an unknown centurion, but that tells us about his career. He served in Macedonia, Upper Germania, and Britain. To be able to study things like this, albeit there are pitfalls to be aware of, we can begin to unravel numerous possible cultural or ethnic backgrounds of people living and dying on the frontier, and how the different cultural influences may have converged, but also how people have moved around and potentially picked up different traditions or ways of doing things from the people that they've interacted with. And it's those life biographies that are really important to understand the kind of the melting pot um, that was the frontier. Just from a study of tombstones of the 20th Legion alone, Malone has been able to identify areas the soldiers were recruited from. And as you can see from these maps, lots from North and Italy, but even as far as Syria and modern day Turkey, as well as Spain, so you can start to build a picture of the types of different um, influences that may have converged in and around these kind of military frontiers, purely through the soldiers, the people that interacted there. And we have to remember that it's not just the soldiers, although they were a prime kind of driver of this mobility. Families moved together. Here we have an altar from Chester dedicated by a father and son who denote their kind of their origins or their background as Samosata in modern day Turkey. Women and children are commemorated around Roman Britain, but also in the frontier, further emphasising that this was not just a military space for male soldiers. Their families, their wives, their sisters would have lived here as well. And for whatever reason, someone traveled to Britain to, to make their living or live their life, especially in the frontier, their cultural traditions would have been brought with them. And here we can see this tombstone doesn't really say a lot. He lies here buried in his own ground. However, this implies the use of a delineated burial plot. And this was not a common practice outside Italy and certainly not in Britain. So this person is commemorated, but they're also being treated in a way which they were accustomed to in their own kind of cultural tradition. And this is where for archaeologists, cemetery evidence can be really important in understanding not just the population and proportions of men and women, diet, if there's any human remains that survive, but also the ways in which people treated the dead can tell us a lot about 
um, sort of the values the society had or perhaps the wider beliefs. At Chester, a cemetery known as Infirmary Field was excavated by Professor Newstead between 1912 and 1917. And you can see the plan at the top there of these Roman burials. There were a mixture of assemblages, or what we might call grave goods. Um, it was very much domestic rather than a military assemblage. Lots of items relating to perhaps the civilian population that lived outside the fortress walls rather than the soldiers that were stationed inside it. So the families perhaps of soldiers, but also the civilians, the traders, um, the blacksmiths perhaps, um, the doctors, that sort of thing that might have lived around the fortress. A lot of the grave goods are quite high status, so the objects buried with the deceased are of quite um, they're, they're sort of decent quality, uh, quite a few continental or lavish or exotic goods, which interestingly appear to have been uh, buried more with women than with men. There were quite a few grave goods that were broken, leading to discussions about the retention of religion, of, of Gallic practices or Britain Iron Age practices rather than perhaps classical kind of Roman or Italian practices. So you started on excavation and analysis of different burials. Not everyone was buried in the same way. You had some sort of Celtic or Iron Age traditions, possibly, as I mentioned, Gallic or from Britain. The burial of women with mirrors was very much a kind of a high status, late Iron Age practice in parts of Britain and northern France. The deliberately broken grave goods, perhaps a Romano-British or a local phenomenon, rather than perhaps a, a Mediterranean one. Yet on the reverse of that, you had some graves that were lined with tile. Some of the deceased had coins placed in their mouth as payment to Sharon, and lamps with them to aid their journeys to the underworld. So you can start to kind of get a feel for the way in which individual traditions, um, identities, practices were all played out differently within one cemetery. And that kind of gives an idea of the vibrancy of the community that was buried there and the coexistence in and around the fortress. And some people, soldier or civilian, that travelled to Britain decided to settle there and make it their home. For example, here we have a tombstone of a retired soldier, Gaius Valerius Crispus, a veteran of the Second Legion, the Adiatrix, who retired and presumably because we've got his tombstone commemorating him, died in or near to Chester. And so some of our rural population, as well as the sort of the population of the civilian settlements attached to fortresses, may well be ex-soldiers. And this is something that you get in Roman Britain with villa settlements, these kind of rural farms that have quite highly Romanized styles of building and architecture. For example, the villa at Eton by Tarpoli, not far outside Chester itself, where it's a traditional sort of or a classic winged corridor villa. Um, so you have a range of rooms off a corridor and then two wings at either end. But the trappings of a more kind of Mediterranean or Romanized way of life with hypercourses, complex water supply systems, painted plaster on the walls, that opus signinum flooring that we saw in the extramural complex of buildings at Killian. But these ones were based on agricultural activities, so corn drying kilns. Life beyond the military frontier, the agricultural life that continued or existed in the frontier is just as important to consider. And so to finish up, I just want to think about the civilian settlement beyond the direct kind of military control or associations. Rural settlement in and around the frontier area is not as well known archaeologically as other areas of the south and east of England. And part of that is due to just the levels of preservation, survival, but also the fact that not so much modern building goes on in the north and the west of Britain, um, or hasn't traditionally, not so many modern urban areas where this stuff tends to be found as part of the planning process and the construction process. But where we do have it in the Western frontier, it has been picked up through what we call commercial archaeology or developer-led archaeology. 
a lot of it is largely roundhouse architecture that dominates. So these are the, the types of housing and domestic structures that are actually in existence from the Bronze Age all the way through the Iron Age and Romano-British period here in the Western Frontier area. They have varying degrees of Roman artefacts or kind of continental artefacts. You don't get very many large complex farming estates in the frontier zone. Where they do exist or where they've been found to date, they kind of exist in the southern part of the Western Frontier. So the southeast of Wales um, is the kind of the main concentration, I suppose, of, of these bigger villas like the one at Eton by Tarpoli, or even bigger than that. Otherwise, you have a cluster of the sort of slightly more Romanized rural settlements, these villas um, around northeast Wales, but they tend to be quite simple. So perhaps not far from Chester, giving rise to the idea of, again, these retired legionaries and um, these veterans that might be given land or might be sort of um, farming and still benefiting from their military ties. Some of the rural settlement demonstrates a, an almost a continuation from the late Iron Age onwards. So, for example, the Romano British farmstead at Witton in the Vale of Glamorgan in South Wales. In the later Iron Age, it's um, a sort of a farmstead here. You can see the roundhouse architecture that I mentioned earlier and what it looks like archaeologically on the right hand side there. Excavated um, in the 1950s, um, it demonstrates the way in which a settlement changed. It's characterised by changing modular layouts from roundhouse architecture to combinations of roundhouse and rectangular architecture to the development of what could look like a provincial villa, albeit a small scale one, not one of the massive ones like you might get in Gloucestershire or the south of England. But nonetheless, it demonstrates how the inclusion of being part of the Roman world and um, being under imperial power ultimately led to changes in ways of life and domestic architecture. But that's not the same everywhere. And there are some sites in and around the frontier that almost suggest a resistance to Rome. So here we've got Kevin Grynog at the edge of Snowdonia in North Wales, where we do have pottery from the Flavian and Antonine periods and from the late third and mid fourth centuries. It's uncertain whether there were periods of abandonment between these kind of dates, but the lack of um, connectivity, if you like, when it comes to material culture, the lack of the pottery styles that we might expect in and around a frontier zone that is ultimately quite well connected, seems to be quite demonstrable. And one has to question why that is. Is this an outward resistance to being part of the Roman kind of way of doing things, the Roman economy um, and the Roman material kind of trappings of life? Or is there something more complex going on? Are they not able to access, access certain political, social, economic networks? The effective nature, the relational links the local situations all need to be questioned because not everybody living in the frontier zone is having the same experience of Rome. So the frontier was multi-layered, it was multifaceted. At the top you had imperial control via the military and state and even if only partially some a civilian administration and that control reached over territory, resources, and ultimately impacted people's personal experiences of the frontier. Over time, it transformed in a way that demonstrates how imperial policy and priority affected very localised situations. Experience of the frontier would have been discrepant and highly dependent upon a person's relationship with the state. Those who did well out of the military presence likely had access to more economic networks and goods. Hence the evidence we find from villa sites and urban spaces. Those who did not are perhaps reflected in those rural sites where assemblages of objects and material culture suggest a lack of connectivity and a greater continuation of local traditions. Or perhaps that's too simple 
And in some situations, we have connectivity, but perhaps a refusal or a denial of being part of the Roman world, a disinterest. And then there are those who are archaeologically invisible, the slaves that were actually working in the mines. Where were they living? There must be settlements out there, rural sites that are yet undiscovered. So in order for us to really understand the narrative of this frontier and the ways imperial power were performed or resisted, as archaeologists, we need to consider frontiers as dynamic zones of interaction rather than as static lines, whether or not they were delineated by a wall. The frontier was political, it was temporal and it was spatial. It incorporated the landscape, architecture, the raw resources and materials. It incorporated people, their various cultures, their traditions and beliefs, all of which were played out in their daily lives. As such, the frontier created memories and emotions, only part of which was structured by imperial power. But we must not forget that the people of the frontier also facilitated that power. In that sense, their role in the, in the negotiation and the maintenance of imperial power across the rest, Western frontier was just as important as any political impetus from Rome. Thank you for listening. I know I've gone on a little bit too long, um, but hopefully you've learned something about archaeology, uh, but also Romano-British archaeology, but also the kind of the dynamics of frontiers in Roman Britain.